All right, so welcome back everyone for the second session of the day, second and last session of today. Um, so I'll be chairing the next two talks. And um, I'm very uh, happy to welcome for our first talk, Professor Xiao from Carnegie Mellon University. He's gonna show us how um, the stacking domain walls give us a new handle on one dimensional physics. Please take it away. So um, uh, I would like to uh, first thank the organizer for the invitation. So today I will tell you some of our recent work on stacking domain wall and uh, how, how it can, can find the uh, one-dimensional um, magnets. So let me let me first uh, acknowledge my collaborators. Um, so so this work is uh, uh, mainly done by uh, my postdoc Chung Wang and also Nikhil Saladas, who is a former student, and also the, uh, I also collaborated with Satoshi. Okamoto at Oak Ridge and also Sheldon Shi at the University of uh, Washington. Um, so I, I think we probably see this figure maybe a billion times. Uh, it really shows you this potential of one of our higher structures in this very nice analogy to, to Lego. But what this implies seems to be that you have to put uh, uh, two different uh, materials uh, uh, together to, to realize new functionalities. Uh, but now, of course, we know that even if the uh, two layers involved in the header structure are the same. We still have a new degree of freedom to, to tune, which is the uh, stacking order. Um, so shown here is this very familiar uh, picture of the twisted bilayer graphene. Um, as you can see that uh, on, on, on the left is what this Moray pattern uh, looks like. You can see this, uh, uh, pu <coughs> this uh, pu periodic pattern of, of the Moray potential. Uh, but uh, on the on the right, it really shows the schematics of what uh, this Moray pattern is doing. Right? It's, it it basically uh, by twisting angle, you basically realize a periodic pattern of uh, the stacking domains, which are mainly A, B, and B, A in graphene. And at the corner, you will have this really really stacking. So in some sense, the twist electronics fundamentally is really just about the stacking uh, engineering. So the so the stacking uh, domain wall in uh, in the Moray super lattice is such a special case because it was realized by by a twist. And it, it turns out that this, the stacking domain wall is actually uh, everywhere uh, in, uh, in in two two dimensional crystals. So so just here to give you uh, two examples uh, on the on the left, you can see that uh, sometimes in in a graphene you could have the so called green uh, boundaries. It's basically the left and the right set are mirror images of each other. It's basically have a, have a missing row. Of atoms uh, in uh, in this direction. So here is a uh, optical uh, uh, image of those uh, uh, one-dimensional uh, domain walls. As you can see, that those are the are the stacking domain between the AB and the, and, and the BA uh, domains. So similar physics has also been seen in uh, transition metal dichroogenides. Um, so this work is by Feng Wang's group. Uh, at Berkeley and recently Harvest Group at Columbia, uh, what they, they did is that um, uh, instead of uh, go, go to look for uh, stacking domain walls, they purposely engineered those st stacking domain walls by uh, applying a string to the TMD system. Then you can you can see that they can realize the so-called string solitons. And uh, shown here is a STM image. You can see that at 3% of a uh, string, you can see those lines are sort of one-dimensional periodic array of this uh, stacking domain wall. <clears throat> so this, this just tells you that not only uh, stacking domain wall uh, is universal, uh, th there's also greater tunability either by twisting, by string, or by some other means. Um, so why are those stacking domain wall uh, interesting? Uh, so in the case of uh, bilayer graphene, by now we know that uh, the domain wall connecting the AB and the BA domain Actually, corresponding to the re reversal of the sign of the mass term in the uh, in the Dirac fermions, and as such, it, it, it will have carries a one-dimensional uh, connecting channel on the edge. So this is a near-field uh, optical image of the Moray uh, uh, Moray super lattice. You can see that uh, on the edge of the basically on the domain wall, there's this one-d connecting channels, which will give you some enhancement of the plasma signals. Um, so basically, now we, now because because you know of course in condensed matter everything begins with a lattice. Therefore, anytime you can introduce a variation of your lattice structure, you are basically modifying 
the Hamptonian for your uh, quasiparticles, electrons or megalons, phonons. Uh, so therefore, uh, the natural question we're gonna ask is, what about a, a two-dimensional magnet? What are the interesting things uh, could happen if I have a second new wall in a, in a 2D magnet? Um, so to answer this question, uh, in my talk, I will mainly use uh, chromium triadide as uh, an example. So in an in earlier talk, uh, Dalia has uh, given a very nice introduction about uh, this material properties. So I, I will just pick out some important uh, factors that's to, uh, to us. So, 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 so those are the, uh, chrome, uh, are the crystal structure of chromium triadide, right? It's, it's basically the, the same structure as uh, Lucidian chloride. In fact, I think uh, so far, the majority of the two-dimensional magnet crystallize in this honeycomb structure. Uh, this uh, white uh, atom here is chromium. You can see that it forms this honeycomb uh, lattice. And then each of the chromium has a uh, uh, iodine cage that uh, surrounding it. So, lo so, so local symmetry is actually uh, cubic, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the z-axis is in the one 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 direction. Okay, so chromium triadide is actually known for many, many years. I think that the first paper is really appears in the, in, in the, in the, in the 50s. And uh, most recently, Michael McGuire at uh, Oak Ridge, they uh, synthesized the sample and they did some bulk uh, char characterization. What they found is that you can see that when they measure the magnetic moment as a function of uh, magnetic field, uh, you have a very different response to the impling and the and the uh, outer plane B field to show you that uh, the chromium triadide in the bulk is actually a ferromagnet and it is a very strong outer plane easy access. Um, so then, uh, 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 then the, uh, a very interesting thing they found in the paper, which actually I, I think uh, didn't gather too much attention is that uh, in this material, there is actually a structural phase transition which happens to around 210 Kelvin so at, a, at the higher temperature, it has the so-called monoclinic stacking. Uh, Dalia also mentioned that. So this is the, what the monoclinic stacking looks like. And then, and then notice that here we only show the, the chromium atoms. As you lower temperature from to, uh, above 210 Kelvin to below, the system will undergo a structural phase transition, which is, which is basically a, a, a rigid shift between the layers. Then it will go to the so-called monoclinic uh, the, the so-called uh, rhombohedral stacking. And uh, so the monoclinic stacking, the symmetry group is uh, C2M or C2H, uh, which has a uh, implant uh, two, uh, two-fold original symmetry. Well, for the rhombohedral stacking, it has an uh, outer plane uh, three, uh, three-fold original symmetry. And uh, the magnetic phase transition, of course, happens way below the, uh, the structural phase transition, roughly at uh, uh, six to one Kelvin in the bulk. So that's what we know about the bulk crystal. Um, so, so basically, um, uh, in a, a couple of years ago, uh, Pablo and the Chardonnay's group, they, they synthesized this uh, atomic thing, chromium triadide. And a, a very interesting thing that uh, was found was that uh, in Mona layers, you can see that uh, this uh, mag magnetic uh, hysteresis loop uh, shows the standard uh, uh, ferromagnetic behavior. But for the Mona, for the bilayer one, that's what they see in the experiment. Uh, by now that we know that this is basically standard uh, uh, anti-ferromagnetic behavior, and, uh, and this is a basically spin flip uh, transition. But uh, around that time, when we first saw the experimental result, it was quite puzzling to us because uh, because we know that in uh, in inside uh, in, in bulk the system behaves like a ferromagnet. So therefore, to 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 interpret the the data is actually quite puzzling to us. So to, to answer this question, um, we have to really go back to the bulk measurement and what really caught our eye is this structural phase transition, right? And if that structural phase transition, this indicated that uh, uh, there should be at least a true local minimum uh, uh, of, this, uh, of the energy when you, when you shift the two layers. So follow, follow that, uh, that idea, we basically uh, look at how the magnetic interaction change as the stacking. Uh, so the, the following calculation is done using standard density functional theory calculations. And we, uh, we have choose a U value of uh, uh, three EV to, to take into account of the correlation uh, uh, effect. So you can see that uh, this um, uh, axis is the, is, the, is the shifting vector, while the Y axis is, is basically the, 
the total energy of the system. And that, as you can see that indeed we have find uh, this uh, AB stacking, which uh, we used AB stacking in our paper, but uh, which corresponding to the rhombohedral stacking, and also this AB prime stacking, which corresponding to the monoclinic stacking. So as you can see that if you just look at the total energy of the of the system, there are indeed two stable stacking. Uh, what's more interesting is the is that the only way we try to fix the to, the, the spin configuration to be uh, ferromagnetic and uh, and the layered anti anti ferromagnet, and then we calculate the uh, total energy uh, difference. So you so you see that uh, this blue region would correspond to uh, ferromagnetic configuration, where this red region corresponds to anti ferromagnetic configuration. You, now you can clearly see that as you shift one layer against the other layer, then this interlayer exchange will actually oscillate between uh, the ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic region. So this seems to give us a very nice uh, possible explanation of why in the atomically thin samples, uh, they have seen this uh, anti-ferromagnetic uh, configuration. Uh, so we, our hypothesis is that uh, the stacking must be different. So just to show you the whole picture, then, because you know we are talking about a a, a, a two-dimensional systems, the stacking uh, vector is a, is a two-dimensional vector. So this is the total energy and this uh, interlayer exchange on this uh, two two-dimensional space. Again, you can you, you can see that those are the uh, local minimum position. They they, they have a nice C three uh, symmetry, and uh, this uh, blue and the red region corresponding to uh, the um, ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic uh, uh, configurations. So, uh, so basically, um, now we know that uh, this uh, rhombohedral stacking would correspond to a ferromagnet, and the monoclinic would correspond to anti-ferromagnet. But how, how to, how to un understand this? So here I'm not gonna give you a very uh, detailed analysis, just sort of some hand weaving uh, arguments. We know that in chromium triiodide, chromium, uh, three plus. Uh, so basically, the T2G manifold is a fully filled, and the EG manifold is actually empty. When you look at uh, the band structure, the uh, connection band is uh, dominantly uh, the EG orbital from chromium. And, uh, well, in the, in, in the valence band edge, it's uh, mostly P orbitals from iodine, while the D orbitals are buried uh, below that uh, uh, from the energy. Uh, so, so clearly, clearly, you can see that. Uh, uh, from here, the, when you have, uh, when the top and the bottom layer are both ferromagnetic, then the T2G to T2G hot is, uh, uh, spin forbidden. So, so, so therefore the T2G EG hopping would uh, favor a ferromagnetic, uh, interlayer exchange. Uh, while if the two layers are, uh, are anti-ferromagnetic couple, uh, then the T2G to G hopping would favor uh, anti-ferromagnetic, uh, um, uh, uh, exchange. So now, but uh, what makes the things even more complicated is really that uh, we are talking about a, a super super uh, exchange because of the sandwich structure. A uh, electron would have to jump from the d orbitals to to the p orbitals from the top layer iodine to the bottom layer iodine, then go to the uh, the bottom layer uh, chromium atoms. Um, so so, but but uh, but uh, quanti qualitatively. Well, what's happening is that as you uh, as you shift the two layers, even though we are talking about a fraction of the unit cell, the bound angle will have a dramatic change. And because of the uh, because of this change, it will give you a different uh, uh, sign of the interlayer uh, coupling. Uh, in fact, we we also found uh, that's uh, some sort of uh, empirical rule is that when you look at uh, the the two the, the two layers. The, the the nearest labor interlayer coupling is uh, it's uh, most likely favor ferromagnetic uh, uh, exchange, while the next nearest labor favor anti ferromagnetic exchange. So in fact, for a given stacking, you can just uh, count the number of uh, uh, nearest labor and the uh, next nearest labors, and then that should give you a rough idea on, on, uh, on uh, whether the interlayer is magnetic or ferromagnetic. Uh, so, uh, so when our paper was published, and also there are uh, some other groups that reached the same uh, conclusion for the second dependent magnetism. Um, so then, so how, how how can we be sure that this is indeed the uh, the 
the case. So this is uh, Sui Wu at uh, Fudan University. Uh, what they have recently done is to look at uh, the second harmonic uh, generation. That's a, actually a very, very interesting uh, piece of physics here because the uh, crystal structure of the chromium triad bilayer actually have inversion symmetry. But uh, if you consider this uh, uh, anti-ferromagnetic configuration, when you have spin up and uh, spin down between the two layers, then it will actually break uh, the the inversion symmetry, right? So, so basically, that's what they see is that uh, when the temperature is above the new temperature, uh, there's no SHG signal because the system has inversion symmetry. But with the onset of the uh, anti-ferromagnetic order, uh, it breaks the inversion symmetry. Then you can see this a very nice increase of the second harmonic uh, uh, signal. Uh, but uh, most importantly, when they try to look at the angle dependence of the SHG, you can clearly see that this only have a two-fold uh, symmetry rather than three-fold. So this is consistent with our prediction that uh, the monoclinical one, which uh, has a C2 symmetry, is the symmetry that uh, people see in the atomically thin crystals. Um, so, so, so this idea that uh, when you shift the, the two layers, right, the, the, the bound angle will change rapidly, which will give you a very large uh, tuning of the interlayer uh, exchange here. Obviously, should be a very universal phenomena, as Dalia mentioned in her talk, that uh, they also found us, uh, similar maps of the interlayer exchange in chromium uh, trichloride. So, so now uh, we, we have seen that uh, for when you consider this uh, one of our magnet, now we have this new degree of freedom we can tune, which is the stacking. So, what's the consequence of the stacking dependent uh, uh, magnetism? Um, so let me show this uh, picture, show this two picture again. So on the on the left, this is the interlayer binding energy, and on the right is the interlayer exchange. And uh, you can see that uh, this uh, blue, uh, this red dot here corresponding to the rhombo stacking and shown here. Uh, so this is the shifting vector. This is the B vector we define the stacking vector, and the blue dots are the monoclinical one. And also there's AA stacking, turns out that AA stacking is a local minimum, but much higher in energy. Um, so, so when you look at those two pictures, uh, the first you, sh uh, you should notice is that uh, for the binding energy, it's really about uh, 100 MeV, that's the energy scale. But uh, for the for the interlayer exchange, it's, it's roughly uh, 10 MeV, so it's one order of magnitude smaller than the binding energy. Therefore, to understand uh, you know this whole magnetism uh, in the presence of the of the stacking domain wall, the first thing we need to understand is the structural domain wall before we can talk about uh, this uh, uh, magnetic properties. So to do that, uh, we just try to uh, first solve this uh, structural domain wall problem. Uh, as we said earlier, there are basically two stable stackings. So therefore, if you think about the domain walls, there are three type of domain walls: rhombohedral to rhombohedral. Monoclinic to monoclinic, and the rhombohedral to monoclinic one. So, so we 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 model the system in the in the following way. So that uh, so we can so basically uh, for the for the interlayer binding energy, this is uh, extracted from the density functional theory as shown in this map. So, so the layer index is a discrete uh, index, but uh, for the intralayer. Uh, uh, one, we use the canadium limit. Basically, we use the uh, elastic theory and the right the interlayer energy in terms of those uh, bulk and shear modulus. Uh, so, so those are the uh, numbers again uh, extracted from our uh, density functional theory ca calculations. And once you have that, then obviously you can try to minimize this uh, uh, energy by by solving the Euler Lagrangian equation. So we're using a gradient descent method to find the ground state. Um, so you can see that for this uh, rhombohedral to monoclinic uh, uh, stacking domain wall, which is uh, corresponding to this line here. Um, so this potential can be actually modeled by a, uh, can be approximated by a cosine function. In, then in this time, we, we return to the familiar sine golden equation and you can have, we can have an analytical solution here. But uh, for this uh, rhombohedral to rhombohedral and the monoclinic to monoclinic one, you can see that the energy landscape corresponding to this the red curve and the blue curve here are quite quite complicated. So we we resort to a numerical solution only. 
But in any case, uh, the, the, the physics is the same as the sine golden equation. Uh, one of the things that um, I should have mentioned, I forgot the uh, nine scale here. So the structure of domain wall, the width is about a, a 50 uh, angstroms, which actually is, uh, which also allows us to model the magnetic properties uh, in a continuum limit. Okay. So those are the structural uh, uh, domain walls. So then we can we can try to understand the, what what's going on in terms of spin dynamics on, on those uh, domain walls. Um, <clears throat> so. Basically, here is our map of the interlayer exchange as a function of the stacking vector. And previously, we have obtained the stacking vector as a function of a position by solving this uh, stacking domain wall solution. So then from there, we can extract uh, how this uh, interlayer uh, 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 coupling strength will change as a function of position when you go across the domain wall. So you can see that uh, for so one thing that's interesting is that for this uh, rhombohedral to rhombohedral uh, uh, domain, this interlayer exchange actually deep below zero. So so inside of the domain wall, it actually favors anti-ferromagnetic anti uh, configurations. Okay. So now to to so to to actually solve the magnetron problem, the first thing we need to do is to to determine the classical ground state. So again, we're going to use this uh, functional. So A is the Intralayer exchange, which is on the order of mini EV. Uh, K is the uh, uh, easy access anisotropy, which is roughly speaking uh, 0 0.3 mini EV. And J is the interlayer uh, exchange. For the uniform one, J is about uh, 0 0.3 mini EV. Uh, sorry, 0 0.1 mini EV. Uh, one thing I, I, should, I, I, I should mention, and which I will also come back later, is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in Chromium trilateral, we are really looking at a honeycomb structure. So therefore, there should be two magnetic branches. So obviously here, we're just looking at a low energy and a long wavelength limit. Okay. So now let's analyze the three different stacking domain wall uh, separately. Let's first focus on the rhombohedral to rhombohedral domain wall. As we mentioned earlier, the rhombohedral stacking corresponding to uh, interlayer ferromagnetic configuration. So you would have a, a ferromag have ferromagnet on the right and also ferromagnet on the, on the left. But in the middle, as you can see, this J could uh, dip below zero. So therefore, both A, the, the, the interlayer exchange, and anisotropy would prefer a uniform uh, magnetization, uh, while this uh, interlayer J would uh, actually favor some sort of spin rotation. Uh, but uh, it, it turns out that once you put in the actual number uh, into this energy uh, function, of the magnetic structure of the uh, uh, RR stacking domain wall is uniform, so there's no spin texture at all. Okay, so then we can we, we can we can solve the uh, Landau Lipschitz Landau equation to determine the the magnetic mode. But uh, because we have two layers, uh, so it's it naturally we introduce. A M plus and the M minus, which would correspond to the total magnetization and the magnetization difference between the two layers. And then now you now if you if you introduce this uh, circular basis and uh, plug them into the Landau Lipschitz equation, you see that uh, for the total magnetization, uh, I mean both would uh, look like a Schrodinger equation. But uh, for the total magnetization, the interlayer J doesn't even enter. So therefore, this uh, for this uh, total mode for the M plus mode, it uh, just behave like a bulk magnets. Uh, so so the so the interlayer exchange is invisible to the total one. But uh, for the magnetization difference, the M minus mode, you can see that th this is basically a one-dimensional uh, problem with a trapping potential Jx, uh, whose profile is given by this red curve here. So, so clearly we know that in, in 1D, any trapping potential could trap at least one localized mode. So then this will give us a localized magnetic mode. Um, <clears throat> so from our calculation, uh, the, uh, the magnetic mode is about 0 0.09 mini EV. Uh, so the magnetic gap is actually about 0 0.3 mini EV. So this magnetic mode is, is well below the bulk magnetic gap. Okay, so now, you look at this uh, equation for the M, M, M minus mode again. Now you continue to use this uh, analogy of just a 1D trapping potential. You can see that if the J 
uh, X is very strong uh, inside the, the uh, domain world, then it could be possible that uh, this magnum mode will become zero. And uh, uh, or even even to have negative energy, which indicated that uh, the uniform ground state will start breaking down, and the and the new ground state should deviate from the interlayer FM. So shown here is a uh, this is actually an actual calculation for some very strong interlayer J. You can see that uh, there's a clearly a spin texture, but uh, in in this case um, you can see that uh, um, this uh, magnetic energy. It's actually rotational invariant with re respect to the outer plane direction. I noticed that we used the somewhat unconventional <laughs> labeling of the coordinate system. This y axis is the outer plane direction. So if you rotate along the, the uh, around the y direction, this energy is actually uh, uh, invariant, which which shows you that that should be a ghost mode that corresponding to zero energy mode, right? So then. Adiabatically, if you now gradually reduce your 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 magnum, uh, the the interlayer J, the 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 magnum model should be pretty robust. See, so now we can look at uh, this uh, monoclinic uh, to mono, monoclinic uh, domain wall and also the Ramahajo to monoclinic domain wall. Uh, let's see that. Uh, so shown on the top, uh, how the stacking vector would change. So you can see how this uh, stacking domain wall will will vary in space. Then consequently, uh, by using this uh, the, this x dependence of j, we can numerically solve the, the the ground state configuration, and you can see that in both cases uh, for for the MM domain wall on both sides we have uh, anti ferromagnetic configuration, but the inside domain wall we will have a spin texture, and uh, this one is when you go from a ferromagnetic domain to an anti ferromagnetic domain, then we we will definitely have uh, a uh, a spin texture. So therefore, in both cases, using the same argument, uh, uh, the, we will have a ghost mode for the magnets. So we should have energy at a, at, a, at a zero. And this is actually numerically verified by solving the lambda Lipschitz equation. Um, so here is just a one, uh, two examples of the magnet dispersion uh, for this, uh, one, and, and all the parameters are extracted for chromium triiodide. Uh, for this uh, rhombohedral to rhombohedral, Domain along the along the domain wall direction, you have this very nice almost par parabolic uh, dispersion. But uh, for the monoclinic to monoclinic stacking, you can see that we have this dirac like uh, dispersion, as the, which is expected for anti ferromagnet, and also uh, at a k equals zero, it's exactly zero. That's the ghost zone mode we are talking about. Okay, so 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 far we we, we have basically just just considered. Uh, a one-dimensional uh, stacking domain wall, so you, which can be realized by just uh, looking at a sample because the twin, twin boundaries are, uh, are bound to happen in those two, two D materials. Uh, of course, the other way is to to do a twisting. I think somebody also asked the question during Dalia's talk. So we actually have a look at the twisting more carefully. Um, so you can see that. Uh, uh, shown here is uh, twisting at a, at, at a two degree, and those are the, are the shear strain uh, shown uh, that we have calculated. So you can see that uh, uh, this uh, uh, red is a rhombohedral and the blue is a monoclinic one. So those uh, domains will grow because they have the lower energy, and which will then will give you a shear soliton on the boundary. And in the middle, the A8 domain, as, the, as I showed very earlier, it's actually a a local minimum, but a way higher than in energy than the monoclinic and the rhombohedral. Uh, but at the two degree, you can see that that's a basic a, a region that's a domain. So this shows you that at large domain, you can actually uh, force some unnatural stacking. I mean, a lot of fun in nature to appear in a uh, in in a system. Uh, but now, uh, if we continue decrease uh, the twisting angle, what happened is that. Uh, then the system will have uh, even have a very large space to relax. So uh, at a critical angle, the, the domain wall width should be insensitive to the uh, to the twisting angle. And so shown here is actually the elastic energy as a function of the twisting angle. You can see that one degree, roughly speaking, is a critical angle. So below which, then then we should be able to model the system using our uh, one-dimensional system. Um, so now you can see that uh, this is basically 
Yes. Just to give you a heads up that we're slowly uh, entering the question time, but you know. To... Yeah, I only have uh, two more slides. Okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Take care. So, uh, uh, so now you can see that uh, this is uh, a large scale join of a uh, Mori, of basically the Mori pattern at a 0 0.1 degree. So you can see that uh, uh, this shape is a monoclinic one. So I have a three monoclinic stacking because you know the 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 for you can rotate the stacking vector by 100 degree, 120 degree. They are actually in equivalent. And this shape is the uh, 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 is the uh, uh, hydro stacking. So now if I zoom in, this is what the pattern looks like. Uh, so the blue blue region are the monoclinic one. They are anti-ferromagnetic. Uh, the red region are the uh, the Romohedro one, they are ferromagnetic. So obviously between the boundary, on the boundary between the FM and AFM region, here I should have a, a, a one, one dimensional magnet mode, but even between the ferromagnetic, uh, the FM, FM domain and the AFM, AFM domain joined here in uh, in red and blue, I should also uh, trap this uh, 1D magnet mode. Okay, so, so, so th this is essentially uh, our result. Uh, let me just uh, to discuss two two things. One thing is that uh, let me go go back to this uh, honeycomb nature of chromium triiodide. Uh, you can see that um, uh, the um, if you just look at uh, the max near, nearest labor bound, uh, it actually allows a geologic Moria interaction. And uh, in, uh, in in this case, this two uh, D to the honeycomb magnet, I actually realize a Hodan model for magnets. If you write it into the Hosan Primakov uh, representation, then this will just correspond into the complex uh, uh, hopping in, in the Hodan model. So, 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 so therefore, in this Mori magnet between the FM and the AFM region, there should also be a topological uh, edge mode. Uh, but the one thing I, I want to point out is that uh, uh, this uh, topological edge mode obviously lives between the acoustic and optical branch of the magnets, which is roughly, uh, I think, about uh, 15 mini, mini EV, while the, the 1D magnet channel we were talking about uh, is actually close to zero. So if you think about some sort of a thermal transport measurement, uh, the signal would be dominated by those low energy magnet mode. Uh, so the next question is that, because uh, we were really just using a one dimensional model to try to understand this Mori physics, you could very well to ask that what happened at uh, this position where I use a star to indicate when, uh, when all the magnet nodes merge uh, uh, together. I think in, in this case, it probably a momentum-based approach is more appropriate. And particularly recently, uh, Balance and the collaborators have uh, uh, calculated this uh, um, magnet spectrum for the entire Mori lattice. So I think that would be a, a more appropriate approach if you want to understand the entire uh, structure of the Mori magnets. Um, so let me let me summarize. So what we show is that uh, uh, again, chromium triiodide is different from graphene because it has a two symmetry in equivalence stacking domain, and this will give us a three type of uh, stacking domain walls, and all of them we have shown that support one dimensional trapped uh, magnet modes. Um, and uh, then if you go to a small angle twisted uh, bilayographene, they, they should host uh, this uh, network of one dimensional magnets. Um, and uh, most importantly, we show that uh, the stacking domain wall are important in understanding magnetic properties. And uh, it make offer, offers a new way to stack engineering of one dimensional physics. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for a very clear talk. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Maybe I can start off with a question. So to, to better understand what you mean when you say, you call these 1D channels Goldstone modes, correct? Yes. Um, so just to check. So first of all, um, the 2D system, um, so the symmetry breaking, I think you mentioned the magnons are gapped. So it does, is it breaking a continuous or discrete symmetry in the 2D system? Oh, it's just the, if you, yeah. So my, my, my point is very simple. If you look at the magnetic energy shown here, Right. This is already for the interface. If I'm just uh, yeah, this is already for the interface. So basically, but, 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 oh. but, but, but when I when I say it's for the interface, basically, 
the A and K would still be a constant. Those are the intralayer exchange and the anisotropy. Only J will have some spatial dependence across the domain wall. Right, but, but just to check, so basically what I'm trying to ask first, before the interface in the 2D system, are there Goldstone modes there? Or is the oh no uh, because uh, because I have a um, I, I have an associated K there so all uh -huh. the magnum mode in the right. bulk is happening okay and and when you call the one D interface uh, Goldson modes it it doesn't break symmetry right so but you mean no. more like so, the, the spin half so Heisenberg I guess like a maybe 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 uh, I shouldn't use the Goldson mode but uh, but rather it's just an observation that when you look at the magnetic energy uh, if you mm -hmm. rotate the the uh, the moments around the outer plane direction mm -hmm. is actually uh, invariant, so that should give you a dynamical mode, which doesn't mm -hmm. host energy. Right, right, right. And so physically, the order parameter along the interface would be zero. If there's no long range order along the interface. Is that correct? Uh, I guess I. I'm not sure if the order parameter is relevant uh, here. I mean, we because in 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 some sense we in because we are talking about a one-dimensional domain wall, right? So mm -hmm. on the at infinity and minus infinity, the magnetic order is fixed to be whatever the bulk value is. Right. So therefore, the so 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 on the domain wall, you just solve this problem with with the boundary condition I mentioned. Uh, Earlier, so I, I'm not sure if that's appropriate to call it, even call it auto parameters. I see, but I mean, if I think of the interface as something like as a one D spin chain, right? Yes. Well, but you're saying that one D spin chain. Also, right? So I'm, I guess I'm a bit confused. So uh, there's one D interface. I should think of that as like a spin and a half Heisenberg chain, roughly speaking, like gapless in that sense, like gapless spinons, or or is it something the gapless is something else entirely? Um, let me say, I, I, I think, it, I don't know, I think it might be dangerous to, to generalize it to, to that way, because let's say, I mean, shown here is the actual spin texture across the Stacking domain wall. Mm -hmm. So there's no okay. So actually, there is a. This would actually be the expectation value to spin. You're saying there's right. Some... Then you can imagine that uh, this structure will repeat itself in the out of uh, your screen direction to give you that one uh, D mm -hmm. uh, stacking domain wall. And we are talking about the expectation localized on this ground state. Mm. Okay. Thank you. I see Oleg has uh, raised his hand. Uh, yes, I mean, I uh, wanted to so essentially continue along this line of questioning. So, um, so you have another parameter, which a uh, ferromagnetic order, which, uh, I mean, goes through some, uh, has some profile in the domain wall, and yes. then the magnetic excitations are vibrations of that other parameter, right? And right. so what, what you're finding is that, uh, so first I'd like to understand the, claim that you're saying that along the you know along the direction of the wall yeah. the spin excitations have linear dispersion uh, yeah that depends on one of them is linear this is like if you if the left and the right are monoclinical ones or maybe let me point out point them this way so for 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 this type of uh, domain wall so you would have AFM and AF layer AFM on both sides. In mm -hmm. the middle, you have this kind of spin variation, and the, and the, and the, this one, when you look at the dispersion along the wall direction, it gives you uh, some sort of linear behavior. I mean, look, th this is this is a purely just numerically solving that problem, and it looks like linear. Right. No. Okay. But so okay. It, so it's linear, but and gapless. I mean, the minimal energy is zero, right? Yeah, exactly. And the other two walls, you find what looks like a quadratic dispersion, right? Uh, no, let me backtrack. So, so this one is between the ferromagnetic and the ferromagnetic. Mm -hmm. This one gave you a parabolic uh, dispersion as well. 
So this would correspond to, um, uh, uh, to, to this situation, okay? Right, but it's a quadratic but dispersion the, along the domain wall direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the, for, the, for the third case, which is between the rhombohedral and the monoclinical one, our claim is that it should still have a zero energy mode, but we, we, we haven't got to the magnum dispersion yet. Uh, but the, the, the argument is, is basically whenever you have some sort of uh, spin texture in your domain wall, then, then, then you should have that zero energy mode. Okay, and then, so okay, so in, again, the claim is that in all three kinds of domain walls, the minimal energy excitation has zero energy, right? Uh, no, just, 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 just two of them, sorry for, for the confusion. For the ferromagnetic one, it really depends on whether you are, whether the, uh, okay, so you see that uh, for the ferromagnetic and the ferromagnetic uh, uh, domain wall, uh, if the interlayer J is sufficiently small, then the ground state would still be uh, uniform across the stacking domain wall. And yes. in that case, you do have a gap. Uh, I mean, you do have a finite energy. Okay. But if for some reason, not in chromium triadide, but you can see that my argument is that if this J is sufficiently strong, then the solution with respect to the uniform configuration would have an active energy magnum mode. This indicates that then the, then the two bronzes should be, have some spin texture. In that case, uh, there should be a zero mode. Okay, and, uh, okay, and so, right. And this, again, when you do have those low energy modes, they are localized, localized on the wall. And so do you know, I mean, the localization, uh, I mean, they confined to the wall. You, you have any idea about the size, the localization radius? Yeah, so, 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 the, so the stacking domain wall size is about 50 angstrom, the, the width. Okay. Uh -huh. Thanks. Let me see if I have a picture to show that. Uh, yeah, so basically that's the, this is the, uh, uh, this uh, in-plane oscillation magnitude for the magnum yes. mode. Okay. So that's basically our way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Um, are there any last short questions before we head on to the next speaker? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. So in your discussion slide, you mentioned the topological edge mode. Is it happening only between the uh, for the AFM and FM domain walls, or? Yeah, yeah, happen? yeah. Because because um, I mean basically, uh, first uh, for a molar layer chromium triiodide, because of the DM interaction, it should uh, carry a non-zero chain number, right? Mm -hmm. So now, if you consider bilayers, uh, you I mean. We, we haven't thought this in, in detail yet, but uh, let's assume the interlayer coupling is some, somewhat weak, that it doesn't change the topological invariant. So then the, then the bilayer FM would give you chain number equals two, mm -hmm. AFM would be zero, right? Or in, in, in other case, you, in other picture, you can think about the uh, bilayers. For bilayer FM, let's say both are spin up, but for the bilayer AFM, it's going to be spin up, spin down. Then in the top layer, uh, it's basically FM goes to FM, you have no edge state. But in the bottom layer, you go from spin up to spin down, you should see a change of number of two. So that should give you mm -hmm. a... But between the, between the FM, because they have the same topological number, I don't, I don't see why there should be a topological mode. I see, thank you. But then you mentioned there is a dip uh, for the FM, the FM domain wall. Yes, there's a, so the, so the deep here, yeah, this is the interlayer exchange as a function of uh, mm -hmm. when you go across the domain wall. Mm -hmm. So the, so the deep, the, uh, the actually deep below zero. Mm -hmm. Right, but the idea is that if you, if you look at the equation for the M minus mode, so as long as it has a dip, the, the dip doesn't have to be below zero. Then it's basically a one, one, one detrapping potential problem. They should, it should have a, a, at least a one localized mode. Okay, yeah, I see, thank you.
Good. Professor Xiao, thank you again for a very clear talk. All right. Thank you very much. Um, then